Right, good morning everybody and thank you very much for joining us here today for Progressive Wealth's market review with 91. As you will know, Investec Asset Management recently rebranded and listed separately uh, and hence today you will see us presenting in the guise of 91 instead of the familiar old Investec Asset Management. Um, a big thank you to PJ Murray for allowing us the opportunity to discuss with you what's happening today in the markets. Um, I hope that what we have to share with you is going to provide reassurance. If nothing else, it certainly is a time where we all could do with a little bit of clarity and a little bit of reassurance. So kicking off, uh, just to start uh, with, I thought was, what was a very nice quote is uh, one from Tom Hanks. And last Saturday night, he started off Saturday Night Live, which for the first time in its history was not broadcast from its Midtown Manhattan studio, but instead from makeshift studios set up in each and every artist's home, including his own. He broadcast from his own kitchen. There's no such thing as Saturdays anymore. Every day is today. And I suppose that's the reality for all of us. And in fact, for probably 50% of the world is now shut down. That has both social and economic consequences. And the one question which we face now which is probably becoming more urgent by the day, although no more urgent than the humanitarian crisis that COVID-19 has sparked, is how do we now exit this and restart our economies? For if we don't do that, people are start going to start to starve and we are going to have social unrest on our hands. The good news is that South Africa seems to have done this better than most. We shut down sooner and we shut down firmer, um, much to my own annoyance, no wine sales, but be that as it may, it seems to have worked and our curve has flattened. So I expect that we will see some sort of opening quite soon, uh, although it will be in a very staged fashion, it will be slow and it will not be to a world uh, that is as it was just a few weeks ago, quite a fundamental change. So what happened? It did seem to come out of nowhere, but as we no doubt know, uh, this was predicted quite some time ago. In fact, 2017, Barack Obama himself actually said that the next uh, big global catastrophe was likely to be a pandemic, and it was likely to be something like a flu. In fact, that is exactly what happened. Of course, early in 2020, the markets were already bruised from the trade war fallout between China and the USA. And we had some indication that a recession was on the cards because the yield curve had inverted. Now, this is something that you may have heard of, which is why I mention it. And it's really usually of interest only to people who follow the bond market. But essentially, what it says is that people who were lending money to others, be they governments or businesses, were starting to become so worried about the near-term outlook, they were starting to ask for more return for short-term loans than for long-term loans. That's a very unusual indicator, and it has preceded every single recession going back over the last couple of years. Now, not every yield curve inversion precedes a recession, but every recession is preceded by a yield curve inversion. So as you can see, this is something that incre increasingly interested everybody. But it was very soon that SARS-CoV-2, the virus itself, and the looming recession um, actually overtook all those worries. Um, but what prompted things to fall over in a hurry was the collapse of OPEC+. Plus. Now, OPEC+, Plus is the group called, as we know them as OPEC, um, primarily led by the Saudis, and the plus represents Russia. And what essentially happened is that Russia and Saudi Arabia fell out over the best way to manage up the oil price. And Russia, being able to tolerate a much lower oil price for a long time, said, we're going to carry on pumping. And they fell out with Saudi Arabia, and the market essentially started to fall for the oil, oil price. And that preceded and prompted the 2020 stock market crash, which began, um, I think, officially is probably the wrong word to use, but I'll use it anyway on Monday, March the 9th. March the 11th saw the World Health Organization declare COVID-19 a pandemic, and the market fell further on the back of that news. And March the 15th saw the most powerful reserve bank in the world respond with a full rate cut, one whole percentage point. First time in I don't know how many years that we've seen anything that bold uh, by the Reserve Bank 
of the United States, which generally cuts only in 25 basis points, one quarter of a percentage point increments. So it was a very, very bold move. Ironically, it frightened people because it made everybody realize that there really is something to worry about here. But uh, at, the, at the same time, it's agreed that it was the right thing to do uh, to support the market. And in fact, we've seen other reserve banks around the world, including our own, follow suit. March the 16th, Imperial College in London issued what has become the seminal report around the pandemic and its spread. Um, and that model um, has, has been updated as we go. Um, you can see by, by following that model, things are getting better, um, which of course ironically makes people doubt whether the model is working because it keeps changing. That's the nature of these models. But be that as it may, it's the best model that we have. Um, and it predicted that there'd be 240,000 deaths in the US if there was not substantial action. And that's what prompted Mr. Trump to start taking the action that he did and supporting the governors of the various states in shutting down and locking down as we have here in South Africa. Of course, the impact of that was to mean markets trended down even further uh, as the economic activity around the world started to slow down. Just as one interesting indication of that economic activity, these are global restaurant bookings, percentage change uh, for the year, and you can see how they just plummeted off a cliff. So literally down minus 100%. Literally people stopped going to restaurants um, on, as, as we measure them by online bookings. These are, are the online numbers. And simultaneously, people started sitting on the couch at home and playing video games. This is uh, the, the daily users of a company called Valve, Valve Software, the Steam gaming platform. And you can see here, it's literally just taken off from around 15 million to close to 25 million, 22 and a half million on that graph. The sell-off, which we all experienced, which we've all lived through now, was brutal. It's not the worst one we've ever lived through. It's the third worst. The worst ever was in 1987, uh, which was nearly 21% down. And this is in dollars on the US stock market. Um, the one that we lived through on the 16th of March, which was the toughest one we've seen in recent times, uh, was 11.98%. Uh, Interestingly enough, you see that on this, in the, in the top uh, six here that we've got, 2008 doesn't even feature. So in fact, we've lived through things that have been tougher than this. Um, the 12th of the third this month was, was tougher, um, and two days in 1929 were tougher. So this is particularly historic. If you were a dollar investor, you saw significant pain. Um, and these numbers here, uh, moving from left to right, are for the global stock market. So these are shares uh, in Japan, the USA, the UK, South Africa, and then the entire world index, emerging markets, and then Europe. And it doesn't really matter which one you look at, they all fell um, particularly hard. In dollars, of course, you can see that South Africa was particularly hard hit coming out there uh, at the bottom. All I want you to look at when I show you this table here, uh, these are the numbers that are represented above, uh, is just look at the second to last column, and that's the year to date number. And you can see that the South African All Share Index, right there in the middle, minus 38.3% in dollars. Now, the thing with all of these numbers is that it's particularly tempting um, if you're commenting on the market to seize on these numbers and become very excited about them. And uh, these are usually the numbers that were repeated over dinner parties and so on. Um, but it's very, very, very important to remember that these are not the numbers that you have experienced because these are in dollars. So unless you're spending dollars, this is not as much use as looking at it in rands, which we'll do uh, in a moment. So I'm going to give you that rand context, which is more useful for you in a moment. The most dangerous words in investment remain. This time is different. It's not different. We've seen this kind of thing before. And I was showing you performance a moment ago. This is now volatility. This is how much daily share prices are moving around the long-term average. Um, and you can see that we've seen similar levels before. Uh, the global financial crisis was nearly as bad as it is now. But relative to the long-term history, which is the dotted red line, down there at the bottom, you can see this has been pretty dramatic. So it's been a spectacularly volatile time. And the reason I point this out to you is that a lot of people are saying to us, oh, it must be time to get back into the market. Surely this is the right time. This graph tells us that the daily swings are such that unless you really have 
patience, time, and spare money. This is not the time to rush back into the market with your spare money and hope that you're going to make money over a month, two months, three months, or even a year. It's very, very uncertain what is happening. So slowly, cautiously, and watchfully um, are the words to employ at this stage. It's not different this time, but it certainly is more volatile than we've seen uh, in the last 10 years. So was this a pandemic? This was the pandemic and the and the virus a black swan? As I pointed out a little earlier, no, uh, it, it in fact wasn't because black swans are things that are impossible to predict. They have extreme impact, and they're possible to explain in retrospect. And both of these were actually only two of those things. They were both predicted. Both the virus itself and the pandemic were predicted. What I will point out, though, um, is that the coincidence of the fallout between the Saudis and the Russians, the OPEC plus disaster, and the subsequent oil glut, that coincidence with the pandemic was not predicted. And in a sense, that is the black swan. Something also to look at in all of these numbers, we, we, we all becoming swamped with these. We all are there now amateur doctors, amateur epidemiologists, amateur statisticians, and fighting with all our friends and family on Facebook and over the breakfast table. But this is a probably more useful measure of what's actually happening out there. And I understand these numbers get outdated very, very quickly. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see that they've changed quite substantially. But this is how many people have become ill with COVID-19 per million people in a country. So it gives you an indication of the penetration of the disease into a country. The absolute number of infections does not matter that much. The same number of infections in the US and Spain does not have the same impact on the healthcare systems because there are far fewer people in Spain. And that's why you can see, looking at the penetration rate in Spain here, on this graph, the US does not yet even show up. I understand, of course, that things have changed quite substantially by now. I wouldn't be surprised to see that the US has moved. Of course, it's really about South Africa, though, and here you can see uh, what has been happening has been quite dramatic. This is the largest shares performance on our stock market for the first three months of the year. And as you can see, um, it's a remarkably small number, only eight shares that did performance, a positive performance over that period. The average performance was minus 27%. Sasol le losing nearly 90% of its value over that period because of the oil price. That's a particular situation there. Um, but in fact, um, many of the other stocks taking a massive smack as well. Nedbank, for example, Investec, Absa, Implats, Growth Point, and Woolworths right down there at the bottom. These kind of extreme performances begs the question, is Nedbank really worth two thirds less than it was just before this pandemic broke out? And the obvious answer seems to be no, that's the wrong number. But what's not clear is what is the right number. And that right number will only be clear once we see the impact on their earnings. So right now the markets are very cheap, but the earnings are not yet clear. So what is happening is the worst is being discounted in. As I say, this appears to present a wonderful bargain, and it looks like there's a sale on in the stock market. And indeed, things are a lot cheaper than they have been, but caution is still very much warranted. I mentioned context a little bit earlier, and here's that context. This is the 12-month performance, exactly the same performance I showed you for all the stock markets, all to the 31st of March. But this is all in rands. I've just taken three indices here. Our own, which is the stock, our stock market, then the world index, and then the emerging markets index. And you can see that in order, um, we did the worst, emerging markets did the next worst, and the MSCI world, developed markets, did better. If you translate those performances I showed you earlier into rands, the all share index did minus 18% not a great number at all. So if you were a passive investor, you lost 20%, almost 20% of your money in the stock market. However, very few of you would hold all equity portfolios. Your financial advisor, Progressive Wealth, has put you largely in balanced portfolios where appropriate with a tilt towards equities. Within those portfolios, there's also some of the money exposed offshore. And that offshore exposure, be it to developed markets or emerging markets, over the last 12 months was a positive return. And that's why we hold money both here and abroad, in different sectors and in different asset classes. This is the power of diversification. This, of course, purely down to the RAND, but a wonderful free pass, if you like. 
However, it does not mean that your quarterly one statements are going to look positive. It's very likely they're going to show, show losses. It's completely to be expected under these circumstances. We've had, I would say, literally once in a lifetime, even more than once in a lifetime event happen. Moody's, of course, had no choice at all but to downgrade us. It was not in their power not to downgrade us because our growth came in so poorly. Um, and as a result, the bond index in South Africa had the worst performance it's had in the last 20 years. Sorry, in the last, in its history. So this is the 10-year yield going back over 10, over 20 years. And this is the 10-year yield over the last year. This essentially tells you how much the government is having to pay to borrow in the short term. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a one way of measuring it. And essentially what it's saying to you is that the market is demanding an enormous premium right now for lending to the SA government. There would have been a capital loss over the month, but over two, three, and five years, bonds and cash have done a fantastic job and have delivered positive returns. Again, the power of diversification. At these levels, South African bonds therefore still remain attractive. Uh, this graph shows you how much more our market delivers versus other emerging markets. So this is showing you that at this point, versus our competitors for emerging market money, we are delivering 6.3% um, over and above what the average emerging market does to those who lend to us. So it makes our government bonds extremely attractive and they remain uh, a favored asset class. What does this mean for economies in South Africa, uh, including South Africa? What well, you have to expect that the next while is going to see deeply, deeply negative numbers. And the purpose of showing you these is not to frighten you, but to say, expect this. On the left is a forward-looking indicator for the Eurozone. Germany is in blue, the Eurozone as a whole in red. On the right-hand side is US GDP, quarter one and quarter two. And overlaid over that is jobless claims. We've just turned it over. You can see the jobless claims on the right-hand side, that red line have just spiked. So there's been a massive surge in people claiming unemployment in the US across both the US and the European zone, you are going to see GDP contract, so a worldwide recession. It's not a natural thing for it to follow. We've only seen market crashes followed by recessions once in the last few crashes, but that said, this time I think it's pretty much inevitable. Prospects for markets, slightly better. Um, we've had a much bigger policy response this time from central banks of the world. Uh, this is at exactly the same point uh, in the crises, but on the bottom is the global financial crisis of 2008. On the top, the COVID crisis right now. So it's essentially at the same number of days out since the crisis started. And you can see it's three times the response. So in other words, three times the amount of money has been pumped into the system. Um, what has been the reaction? Well, as of the 13th of April, the S&P was up 23% from its March low. So this is that volatility I was talking about. Don't get sucked into these numbers. Don't jump into the market and expect another 23%. That was from a point at which it was quite clear the market had become irrational. And the purpose here is to illustrate quite how irrational the market has been. The South African Reserve Bank has followed suit with other reserve banks around the world, cutting interest rates. We still have a little room to cut, and they've even stepped into the market to provide some liquidity because when foreigners tried to sell their bonds, they couldn't find buyers. So the South African Reserve Bank bought them back. This is uh, much less worrying than it would seem at first glance. Uh, the tally is only about 1.1 billion rand, which while in Real terms is an enormous amount of money. In that market, it's very, very small. Shares are a lot cheaper than they were, both globally. This is looking forward for the three big markets, the S&P 500, then emerging markets and developed markets. And you can see that relative to their history, share prices are a lot cheaper than they were. Price to earnings is a very simple metric. It simply says to you, how long will you take for you to make your money back on the price of the share from the earnings of that share. So the lower the number, the better. As you can see here, they are low, but earnings have not yet been declared and they're going to be not great at all. Relative to history, also a lot cheaper, but again, we have to wait for earnings to be declared. South Africa, 
already looking very cheap, likely to retrace somewhat because we're going to have some very poor earnings numbers coming through. Um, our retailers have obviously done okay because we've been buying and they've stayed open, but things like the banks and the property companies are gonna have a terribly hard time. However, we're a lot cheaper than the emerging markets as a whole, so capital may flow to us on a relative basis because we look attractive relative to other emerging markets for whom, with whom we compete for capital. The one thing that's almost certain is that the dollar is far too strong versus the rand, or the rand is far too strong versus the dollar, depending on how you look at it. Um, it's almost impossible to predict where we'll be a year from now, but it seems to be that the next move should be strengthening over the next period. But of course, all bets are off in the short term, unless we get this economy up and running and export receipts up. The big question, of course, on most investors' minds is what now? What do I do now? And it really is quite simple. In each case here, I've tracked what the markets did in the, lo the last couple of crises. And if we just look um, at a particularly bad one, June 69 to June 70, uh, minus 45.5%, that uh, brick colored bar at the very bottom. And then we track what the market did a year after, three years after, and five years after. And without looking at the numbers, you can see that in every single case, the market does return to positive territory if you're prepared to wait. And that's the trick, is just to wait. Not to panic, not to break, uh, break, uh, break formation, not to step out of the bounds of your plan that you've drawn up so carefully. While we always say be careful of the downside, if you lose 50%, on the far right, you need to make 100% to make it up. Don't be so wary of the downside that you miss out on the upside. Because if we look at Mike, for example, our notional Mike here invests 10,000 Rand at the peak of the market prior to each of the last eight bear markets going all the way back to 1970. So that's 80,000 Rand in total. He has the worst possible luck. He invests each time at the peak of the market and takes the full smack on the way down. Over 50 years, because he hasn't moved the money back out of the market again, he grows that 80,000 to 35.7 million. His friend Mark does exactly the opposite. He invests 10,000 into cash at exactly the same points in time. And so over the bri, every Sunday, uh, over those eight years, he looks very, very clever. But his money only grows to 6.1 million rand over the 50 years. And that's even with the best luck in the world. It's very, very important to bear in mind that the power of compounding only works for you if you leave the money in place. Continually moving it around between fees, costs, taxes, uh, and missing out on the best days, it's a very, very difficult uh, game to play. The medium to long term, well, the encouraging signs from both China and South Korea, this is new cases per country. The black line is China, the red line is South Korea. Containment works. We just need to be patient. What we do know from an economic perspective uh, is that uh, activity, economic activity, bottoms around two weeks after the lockdown. It slowly recovers over the next six weeks um, and it seems in China to have stabilized around 20% below normal. Um, and so we're expecting a similar recovery profile here in South Africa, particularly uh, in the primary sectors. The longer the lockdown, the deeper the recession will be. I think likely is no longer even a question. It's definitely going to happen. Um, but what really concerns us at this point is that the US infection peak is only likely around the end of April, the beginning of May. So there's a long, long time still to come. And there may be policy mistakes in the meantime. So that's something definitely to watch. Here in South Africa, on the left-hand side, GDP, will be down 6% for the year. Sharper numbers in the short term, um, and we will have to fund our economy in some way. And as you can see on the right-hand side, there's a graph for the budget deficit. Um, and the only thing you need to look at here is what our total budget deficit will be um, post-COVID. Um, and we're, we were expecting the budget for it to be 6.8%. That's the one on the left-hand side. On the right hand side post COVID, minus 9.9%, almost 10% deficit in the budget. We may have to turn to the IMF, the old days of their loans being extremely difficult and highly conditional, um, are probably starting to be behind them under new leadership. 
uh, but that is an area that remains to be watched very carefully. We don't have enough money locally to fund ourselves. We will have to find the money elsewhere. Either the BRICS Bank, the New Development Bank, our own bond market, which is likely not big enough, or the IMF, probably a combination of those. There's a long period of pain ahead of us. As you can see from this quote, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics reported uh, 701,000 non-farm job losses for just the month of March. That's an enormous number. There's a lot of people who are out of work, and this is why US corporates are taking up loans. That pop up in the graph there is how many loans they are taking out. This is in uh, percentage change terms. Who is funding them? Well, at this point, it's the central bank is funding them, and it's being exercised via the retail banks. Um, and so far, so good. The system is working, a system that was developed post-2008, but it's going to be tough. We are all going to change how we behave. Uh, I think as consumers, as businesses, as governments, there's going to be significant changes to all of us. How we work, where we work, um, and what we do will probably change. And I think that we are going to see some particularly difficult times um, in areas that are affected by services. So things like, for example, restaurants are going to have a very, very hard time uh, going forward. Uh, the biggest question for everybody, though, I think will be, do you have enough short-term savings? And that's a really important one. I can't emphasize this enough. Is I think it's been revealed how tough it's been in South Africa to save and how few people actually have the savings to weather a crisis of this sort of dimension. Uh, that brings us to the end of today. And thank you very much for your time and your attendance. Please let us know if you have uh, any questions. I'm very glad uh, to be able to help you via PJ. So please email him, let him know what your questions are, and we'll do our best uh, to revert to you. Um, once again, a very big thank you from us here at 91, both for your ongoing confidence and for your support in the past. And uh, we look forward to being of service to you again in the future. Thank you so much. Take care.